You're running. Thank you very much, Luis. Uh, so um, I will continue. And uh, I, I have not yet been finished with SGBM, but first I prefer to do something differently because it's maybe nice to see something different and then we continue with the more technical details. So first I would like to uh, tell you about the so-called seven league scheme. And that is uh, how can we take large time steps in the Monte Carlo simulation of the SDEs? Yeah, so if you think about it, then uh, in Monte Carlo, we always need a time discretization from TM to TM plus one, as you recall, and et, et cetera. And the aim here is to take that time step as large as possible, but still use, uh, um, still uh, uh, get an accurate solution. So I'd like to report on that. That is our recent work. So how does it fall into the, the scheme? It falls in the scheme as follows. So uh, uh, as you recall, we did uh, the option basics and the European option pricing and the neural networks yesterday um, and um, we did American option pricing with PDEs and cost this morning and also we talked about Bermudan options in high dimensions with the stochastic grid bundling method and then today in the first hour I'd like to talk about this seven leak scheme big time steps and neural networks and uh, the second part of today's uh, final lecture for today and we'll give some more details of the SGBM. I'll tell how it works on a graphics processing unit, and I will make a start with CVA, explain what it is, eh? credit valuation adjustment, and that may come back also in, uh, in the, the Thursday lecture. Needless to say, eh, it's, again, it's joint work with many PhD students and co-workers. Without them, these slides could not have been uh, the work could not have been done as nicely. Okay, the first hour for this afternoon section. So uh, for this afternoon session, I will talk about, uh, first I'll talk about some basics of stochastic differential equations. I think that's nice. Uh, it, uh, it brings us all again on the same page. And then I'll talk about our new scheme, seven league scheme. And uh, there are several details there. There's the neural networks, the algorithm details, I say something about error analysis. I'll do numerical results and a summary and an outlook. And it is joint work with uh, former PhD student Swai Cheng Liu and uh, co-worker Lech Krzelek. Okay, well, we know eh, SDEs, they are widely used to model processes, not only in finance, but also in other fields. We even see them in the modeling of the spreading of COVID, for example, hey? and all these things you can model with stochastic processes and uncertain uh, uncertainties, modeling uncertainties. So these are stochastic differential equations. In uh, what we have seen so far was, for example, DST is uh, RST DT plus Sigma ST dw d omega t for example that was one that we have seen and there are many more of course so the aim here is to develop uh, an accurate numerical scheme in the strong convergence sense okay, so in the case of sdes we we have two notions of convergence a strong and a weak convergence and we will work in this advanced course on strong convergence, but we wish to carry out large time steps. So delta T is big here, delta T should be large. And we need to employ a neural network to obtain such a scheme. And uh, I would like to report on uh, how we use that neural network. So first let's uh, consider the setting. We have a random variable ST. Uh, our uh, stochastic process on a probability space omega sigma p and we have a filtration script f of t t running from zero to capital t and we have the sample space at uh, the event space omega the sigma algebra sigma and the probability measure p now we look for a generic scalar eto sde and uh, that is given like this in this case dst is A 
a function a times dt plus a function b times d omega t. And uh, the function a may depend on s and, and on parameters, and these parameters we denote by theta, and the function b also uh, is given by s and the parameters. So if we look back at our, uh, S our SDE, R S T D T plus sigma S T D omega T. We recognize that the parameters would be R or mu if we are in the under the, the real world measure and sigma. Those are the theta parameters and indeed S plays a role in that general function. So B would be sigma times S in this case and A would be mu times S in this case. So we have a drift term A, and we have a diffusion term B, we have a, a Brownian motion omega, and we have an initial value S0, of course. Now, uh, the solution in integral form, uh, we go time step by time step, we make a partition of the time interval, and we have steps delta t. And we say that S at T plus delta T is S at T plus the integral from zero to, of from T to T plus delta T of A S D S plus the integral from, from T to T plus delta T of B S D omega S. Yeah. And the definition of the, of the strong convergence, the strong convergence is the following. Suppose we have an exact solution of the SDE at time ti, and that is given by S at ti, and we have a discrete approximation S tilde with a time step delta t. Now we say that uh, the scheme, the numerical scheme, uh, the solution converges in the strong sense, in the strong sense with an order beta s if the expected value of the exact solution s exact s minus the, the numerical approximation at some time ti when that is less or equal to a constant times delta t to the power beta s yeah so uh, it is the expected value of directly of the, di the difference between the exact solution and the numerical approximation. If we are dealing with weak convergence, then we are dealing with the expect with a, with a function, eh? the expectation of S minus the expectation of S tilde. So we're dealing with functions. Here we directly look at the path, at the path itself, the S path. And we look at the distance, the difference between the numerical approximation, the exact version or the reference version and the numerical approximation. And when this is, uh, the, the, when this exponent tells us what, with what uh, rate we have the, the, the strong convergence. Okay, there are two classical numerical schemes. One is the Euler-Mariama scheme. And that is written as follows. And the numerical approximation for a new time point, i plus one, s hat at i plus one, it is given as s, s hat at point i, plus the function a evaluated at point ti. So it is a at ti at s hat i, and with the, the parameters theta times delta t, plus b, evaluated at ti at s hat i and uh, with the parameters theta times the square root of delta t times uh, uh, x i plus one hat and x i plus one hat that is a realization a, a, a number which is drawn from the standard normal distribution yes yeah, so this this is a number that is drawn from the standard normal distribution it's multiplied by the square root of delta t. So in fact, in distribution, this is like a, a, a Brownian increment, yeah, a, a, Brownian, uh, a Brownian motion. So we see that we are dealing with something like a left rectangular rule. We are looking at, uh, or uh, something explicit. We are looking at a new time step and we evaluate everything at the old time step. 
And the strong convergence of this scheme is one half. Yeah, so it's, a, it's slowly converging. In fact, the strong convergence is one half. Now, the other alternative, particularly for scalar SDEs, and we are looking at scalar SDEs in this uh, talk, is the Milstein scheme. And it has strong order one. So it is more accurate. It converges faster. And that is given as follows. S hat at point I plus one is equal to uh, S hat at I, the time point I, plus again, the terms that we have seen before. So A uh, evaluated at TI times delta T plus B evaluated at TI times the square root of delta T times X hat at I plus one plus a new term. Eh? So that is new to the, to the Milstein scheme plus a new term, one half B prime, and B prime is the first derivative of B with respect to S. So DB dS, yeah, plus one half DB dS evaluated at TI times B times delta T times XI plus one squared minus one. So because of this extra term here, we increase the strong order of convergence from one half to one. So we improve the convergence. We can take bigger time steps or take less time steps and get a similar accurate solution. All right. Now that is nice. Uh, however, it's not so easy to generalize the Milstein scheme to uh, uh, systems of equations. It's not so easy to, to generalize it to systems of SDEs, factor valued SDEs. And suppose that we want to go even higher order, even better strong convergence. Well, there are two common ways to improve the numerical accuracy. The first one is we include higher order terms. Eh? And an important reference is either the book by Kleuden and Platen or a paper by Eckhart Platen from 1999. It's an introduction to numerical methods for stochastic SDEs. For SDEs, in Acta Numerica in 1999. And then like in ODEs, we have runge kutta schemes, we add extra terms. And now we also have extra high order terms and they come from the ITO calculus. Yeah. For example, in order to get a strong convergence of one half, we need eight terms. Okay. So here, here you see essentially one, two, three terms if you wish. We need eight terms to increase the strong order of accuracy to 1.5. And we need 12 terms to improve the accuracy to order two. So we would have 12 terms here in order to uh, get an approximation that uh, gives us uh, a uh, an strong convergence in order two. And of course, the other way to improve numerical accuracy is to reduce the time step. We can make a smaller delta t and then use a finer time grid. And by this, we also improve the accuracy at a finer time. But of course, rather than reducing the time step in this work, we would like to increase the time step. So we'd like to make it bigger, but still get a good accuracy. So how are we gonna do that? First of all, Let's look at these two schemes. Here is the Euler-Mariama scheme one more time, and here is the Milstein scheme. And uh, what we see is that S hat at I plus one, it is composed of several terms. It is composed of a term without X, so an alpha zero, if you wish, alpha zero, that is this part, S I plus A evaluated at T I times delta T, plus a term which uh, plus a coefficient in front of the X, in, in front of the standard normal and uh, the, the random draw from a standard normal. And that is in this case, B evaluated at TI times the square root of Delta T. Yeah. And if we look at the Milstein scheme and we consider how that then looks in this perspective, then we also have an alpha zero and that is SI plus A evaluated at TI times Delta T plus one half db ds times b. That is the term, if you look at it, it is the term here, right? This is without an x, this is without an x. And then here with this term here, we have something without an x. 
So that is the alpha zero term here. Alpha one in front of X is B evaluated at Ti times the square root of delta T. And alpha two, eh, we have an X square here x square if you recognize it so we have an alpha 2 an x square term and that has in front of it uh, alpha 2 is one half dbds times b that is the the other term so we see that this this one is uh, alpha 0 plus alpha 1 x and this one is with a different alpha it's alpha 0 plus alpha 1 x plus alpha 2 x square so in general, these numerical schemes, they can be seen as follows. Eh? So if we say, uh, we look at the conditional, uh, the conditional uh, uh, sample, so S and the numerical S at Ti plus one, given that we are now at STI, eh? because this is, we are given now at SSI. So uh, we look at the conditional function S, Ti plus one given we are at STI, that is in distribution a sum, j runs from zero to m minus one, alpha j xj, and x is then a sample from a normal distribution, from a standard normal distribution. So in fact, and these alphas, these alphas, they are just functions. Yeah, they are functions, functions of s, you see s appearing, functions of Ti, functions of delta t and theta. And theta will also play a role when there is a parameter there in inside A, it will also be there. So the idea could be maybe we can use a neural network to learn these alphas, right? To learn the alphas. We are not going to do that because that appeared not to be so stable, but uh, it could be an idea to learn uh, these alphas. We look for a mechanism so that this is higher order. Yeah, we look for a mechanism so that this becomes higher order. For what alpha values will this be higher order? So, yeah, but for now, it is just the notification. Yeah, it's re we remark that this conditional sample can be seen as a sum of alpha j xj. And now we look for the seven league scheme and seven league is uh, like the fairy tale with the young boy with the big boots and could make big steps right that's the seven league boots and we uh, take big steps through the time domain so we call it the seven league scheme and we abbreviate it with seven l scheme and the seven league scheme consists of two key components first of all we have the stochastic collocation monte carlo sampler it's STMC, and we have a paper on this as well. And the paper is uh, a paper by uh, Griselak and uh, others, 2019. And it's called the Stochastic Collocation Monte Carlo Sampler. And it's, uh, it has appeared in quantitative finance. And the second component in this, uh, in this scheme is the neural network. We learn something. Uh, so we learn something and by learning something, we uh, we can uh, well, we can store something and we get we can get to an accurate scheme based on big time steps. Okay, let's first start with this stochastic collocation Monte Carlo sampler. So if we have two scalar random variables s and x, they are connected as follows. The distribution function of s is in fact. Uh, in distribution equal to the normal distribution of to the uniform, uh, the uniform zero one distribution. And that is in then in distribution equal to the CDF of X. Now let's assume that S is expensive. S, it is expensive to sample from S. It is expensive to invert FS. And uh, let's say X, X is a cheap one to sample from. Think of a normal distribution, standard normal or something like that. So let's suppose Fx is a cheap function to sample from and Fs is, this, uh, is uh, uh, an expensive uh, distribution to sample from. So they are connected via this connection with the uniform distribution, the uniform zero one. 
And again, as you know, in definition, the CDF of S is the probability that S is less or equal to Y bar. And Y bar is the argument. And the CDF of X with this argument X bar is the probability that capital X, the stochastic variable, is less or equal to little X bar. Now we assume that Fs and Fx are strictly monotonic. And from this relation, from this relation, we can find that if we want to, have to find ourselves a Y bar, a Y bar, a sample from uh, the distribution, uh, a, 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 a sample from the distribution, we can say based on this connection that is equal to Fs inverse times Fx of X bar. Yeah, and if we do that, that is generally not beneficial because we just mentioned that the inverse of Fs is expensive. So we don't win anything here. This is an expensive inversion and we are, it's not beneficial to do this. But anyway, it forms the basis of our method. And this Fs inverse times Fx, we can just see as a mapping function G. We call this a mapping function G. And in this case, so then, uh, um, um, so this is both distributional, distributional and also elementalized. Now the idea is the following. If we want to, uh, to approximate Y. We don't want to draw too many samples from this expensive distribution. So let's choose some optimal collocation points, optimal points in, uh, in this function, X hat J, Y hat J, in order to approximate Y bar is equal to G X bar. And how we do that, we do that as follows. We, uh, we uh, make an interpolation out of it. So we make out of this, we make an interpolation. We say this function G can be well approximated by uh, a, an interpolation function GM of X. And that is written as a sum, J runs from one to M of this Y hat J eh, of this collocation point times Lj x bar and Lj x bar is an interpolation function. So this is like uh, an interpolation with m points based on m points and it goes exactly through these m points and for the rest we assume that it is an ideal interpolation and that this function, this interpolation function approximates the target g function as good as possible. Now these y j bar, they are in fact still this infer, uh, this expensive inversion, f s inverse times f x. However, we only need m of them. Yeah, we only need m of them. We don't need them for every point because for all the other points we use this interpolation. So y bar is f s inverse times f x times x j. And the xj's, if this is a standard normal distribution, we know what are the optimal points. For example, these xj's are then the optimal points. They are the gauss hermite quadrature points. In the case of a standard normal, these are the optimal points for an optimal approximation. And lj, x, these are interpolation basis functions. And you can think of uh, uh, Lagrange interpolation or monotonic spline interpolation or Chebyshev interpolation. So these are interpolations. So let's write our Y bar as an interpolation function, an interpolation based on this cheap to evaluate uh, uh, distribution X. So how does it work with this SCMC algorithm, SCMC? First of all, we calculate the cumulative distribution function fx on a set of points. For example, when fx is a normal distribution, we choose the gauss hermite quadrature points. And if we do that, if we compute it on these m points, it gives us m pairs xj fx evaluated at xj. Subsequently, step two, 
we invert the target CDF. So we invert the target cumulative distribution function. That is FS, we invert FS. And that gives us then YJ, because we have these XJ points and we have F XJ that is here, right? And then we invert at M points, at these M collocation points, we invert the, the expensive distribution and it gives us little yj. So now we have M pairs of collocation points, xj, yj. Then we define an interpolation function. Y is gm of x based on these M pairs. Eh? They are, it is exact on these M pairs. And for the rest, it is a suitable interpolation. And now if we want to obtain a sample for S, if we want to draw a sample for S, we apply the mapping. S is G of M of X, and then X is drawn from our cheap distribution, for example, N01. Yeah. So again, we sample from our cheap distribution. We use the interpolation, and by this, we get a sample from our expensive distribution. That is the basis of the SCMC, the Stochastic Collocation Monte Carlo method. And this has exponential convergence to the target distribution in M. So if we take M large, number of points large, we have a very fast uh, convergence to the target distribution. But typically, we only need like five points. If we have five quadrature, five collocation points, we already have a very good approximation of our densities, of our distributions. Remember distributions, they don't look so wild. They look like this, right? Something like this from zero to one. And it's even a, a, a monotonic line because we can invert it. Okay. So what did we do? How do we do the conditional distribution by SCMC? Given the current state, ST, we are looking for a conditional variable, S at T plus delta T, and we write it as follows. The, uh, the variable S at T plus delta T, given that we are now with our variable S at T, that is in distribution equal to G of X, our approximation function G of X, and that is approximately equal to our interpolation function GM of X. So generating a sample path is like drawing samples from the probability distribution conditional on a previous realization. Yeah, so we are always on, in conditional expectations, conditional realizations. We're often dealing with path dependent quantities and therefore we need the conditional realization. So the numerical sample S hat at time I plus one given S hat at time I, that is this uh, interpolation function where we use as input x hat to the power j, yeah, x hat j uh, at time point i plus one. So in the case of Lagrange interpolation, we have the following coefficient form, s hat at i plus one given s hat of i, that is gm x to the j hat at i plus one. And that is in fact the sum, j runs from zero to m minus one of some coefficient alpha, alpha hat at i plus one comma j times x to the power j. And this we recognize, right? This we do recognize because this is in fact the same as we saw with Euler Maruyama or the same as we saw with Nilstein. We have coefficients alpha, and we multiply them with x to the j, x to the j, and x is from a standard normal. So in fact, this is the same as the specific examples that we saw, Milstein and, and Euler, but this goes more generally, right? So the idea is now have what we want to achieve. We could again learn alpha, but that's not a good idea in terms of stability. What we will do, in our uh, seven leak scheme is we will learn instead the stochastic collocation points. So we want to learn this uh, X, 
x uh, uh, x head x bar y bar we want to learn those and then we want to learn them conditionally when we are somewhere and we want we need to take a next step we need to go to the next point this is all based on stochastic collocation points and if we have the stochastic collocation points if we have these y's then we know how to get to a next s by means of the stochastic collocation we know how to do that with the help of alphas we have this interpolation the interpolation will give us the alphas alpha hat times x to the j so we will learn the stochastic po collocation points and the conditional stochastic collocation points and they and we learn that for every time step that is possible for every mu value for every sigma value that is the, the neural network will do that for us and if we if we have those then when we are at a certain point in in the time so this is the time and we have uh, a discretization and this is our s space again and this is our time so we are at some point and then we know exactly where are our conditional collocation points and we know where to move suppose we move over here then again we have learned where the corresponding uh, collocation points are and with the collocation points we basically know the distribution we know the distribution uh, uh, and the density we know the density of uh, of uh, the uh, of the next time step the conditional density so basically we want to learn all these distributions for any time step that is what we want to do and we do that with a neural network again so here comes the neural network yeah? when i talked to luis first about this course he said you have to do a lot of neural networks so every day a neural network, a neural network a day keeps the doctor away. And then uh, here we have a, a neural network. Uh, uh, and again, it is to learn, it is supervised learning. Yeah? So we use it here in the classical way. It's supervised learning. So we have input and output labels. And uh, so we learn uh, with input, we learn the output. The input is all these parameters, eh? all these elements of the function A and of the function B, like SI and delta T and the parameters mu and sigma and the time step. This is our input. And then the output is the collocation point. Yeah, the output is the collocation point. And, and, and uh, M of them, right? M collocation points. So we use a neural network, the A and N, to uh, determine uh, the conditional collocation points. So to condition the conditional collocation points, given that we are at SI, what are the collocation points for the time point TI plus one? We go forward in the time. And when the conditional stochastic collocation points are known, then the mapping GM can be constructed via interpolation. So that is standard in a standard way if we have our the points the collocation points and uh, then we can build our interpolation and we can use our favorite interpolation now as you know eh, the artificial neural network is a function approximator we use a fully connected neural network it has all these layers layer one layer two layer l a it has input variables x uh, accent it has uh, weights and biases, capital theta tilde. It has LA hidden layers. And what we would like to approximate, what we would like to, uh, to, to get out of it is we would like to minimize the loss function to approximate the target function. So we would like to minimize, to minimize a distance. And the distance that we, uh, that we have is uh, D, capital D. And capital D in this talk measures the distance between the predicted values out of the neural network, the predicted uh, values for Y and the true values. And of course, these true values, we, can, we have input-output relations, and these true values we can first learn with SCMC. Yeah, with the SCMC algorithm, we can get outputs, 
uh, we can get many outputs, we can learn them, and by learning them, the neural network will give us for any input, hopefully, the suitable output. So the ANN, the artificial neural network, learns in the offline stage. Okay? So in the offline stage, the ANN learns the conditional stochastic collocation points. So Y, J, J colloc M collocation points, J runs from one to M. Y, J at tau plus delta tau, given that we are now with our S value at S tau, is like a, a, a function, a function which depends on S tau, on tau, on D tau, and on theta. And um, we generate first, we generate many data samples for many different time steps and for model parameters theta. Then we use a numerical scheme with a very, very tiny time step in the training phase, which is offline, right? Which we can do overnight. In the training stage, we use a numerical scheme with a very small time step. And by this, we find for any tau and for any dt, we find the conditional distribution, right? If we, if we use a very, very tiny time step, many, many, many time steps, then we get a very good approximation also with an Euler scheme. And then for any bigger time step, we will get a very good approximation of the corresponding distribution. And that is what we are aiming for. It's a lot of learning, but once learned, once we learned this conditional distribution, S of tau plus delta tau, given S tau, when once we have learned that for many DTs, for many taus, for many S values, for many mu and for many sigmas, we have it in our neural network. Based on this, we, we, we learn, uh, we find the conditional distribution, we calculate the stochastic collocation points with SCMC, and we train the neural network in supervised learning so that we have a function which can always give us conditional collocation points. And then we have an online stage. In the online stage, that's real time. Then we use the trained artificial neural network to generate the paths. So we partition our time domain zero to capital T. So zero less than T1, less than T2, up until Tn, which is equal to T typically. And we have a big time step, delta T, Ti plus one minus Ti. Then we are given a sample S hat at time Ti. And then we compute the M collocation points by means of the trained artificial neural network. So we are somewhere, we give the input STI, TI, TI plus one minus TI delta T, and the, the parameters, and automatically this neural network gives us the suitable M stochastic collocation points. Then we do the mapping function, GM, the interpolation. We sample from X, we sample from the standard normal, for example, and then immediately we get by means of GMX, we get our conditional, new conditional point S at I plus one. And this is accurate because with this GM function and that learned collocation point, we have a very good approximation of the exact, of the exact distribution at a later time point. So we learn at all these points, whatever point you can think, we learn the conditional collocation. We learn the conditional distribution. And we are able to sample it from it in a very cheap way based on a standard normal and a suitable interpolation. And if we want to go uh, to a next time step, we say Ti plus one is Ti and we return until two step two, and then we make a next one. Now, if we do this this way, you see that we make often use of this neural network. The neural network is fast, but you can imagine that in, there are situations in which this may not be so fast. And if this is not so fast, we can still also benefit from interpolation in this case. It is in fact not really necessary to use the artificial neural network for any point and for any path, but it is possible to use it again at special points, to use the neural network only to generate special points 
and then also to use an interpolation in between. And that uh, we will see uh, that later on uh, very briefly. So here is what, what we are, how we are doing it. Uh, and we get multiple, uh, we still sample from an, a standard normal. So the, every time we sample, we get an, a, a different point. Uh, we may get a different point. And that's okay for all these points. We know the conditional stochastic collocation points. So we know approximately where, the how the distribution and how the density of our uh, of our uh, space is. We are in this case we have done it with a Markov process, yeah, so we did it with a Markov process. Uh, but uh, uh, this is also possible for a non-Markovian process, and we are working on the research with a non-Markov process right now. And another interesting uh, step to do is. Uh, to go uh, to multi-dimensions, right? So uh, I do it here, everything with the scalar SDE. Yeah, it is the scalar SDE. So we always see DS, T, but of course to go to vector valued SDEs for S1, S2, et cetera, S3, et cetera. This is even more uh, promising because we can't even define a Milstein scheme in, uh, in vector form. So uh, it is really beneficial to be able to have uh, a vector valued, uh, strong convergence, uh, good strong convergence, um, maybe with the help of the seven league scheme, but that's still current research. What are the errors that we make here? Well, there are uh, essentially two errors. There's the error from SCMC. So that is the error. We approximate our function G with an interpolation an interpolation GMX. And if the interpolation is based on Lagrange, on Lagrange uh, polynomials, we essentially know the error that we make. And the error that we make is related to the first term that we truncate, for which we truncate. Yeah? The first term for which we truncate, that plays a role in the error of, uh, of the Lagrange interpolation. So we know for, for this that uh, it is uh, related to m factorial, 2 over m, the square root of pi. Uh, the function, a function, uh, uh, a function uh, to the, the 2 m uh, derivative of a function at some intermediate point, an intermediate point psi 1, divided by 2 m factorial. And typically, this is small, right? We know that Lagrange. Uh, interpolation is accurate, uh, is, is pretty accurate, and uh, can be often used. It can be used as long as, of course, we're dealing with, uh, uh, yeah, if it generates a function which is invertible, so a monotonic function, then we can use it. So this is one term of the error, yeah, just, so uh, approximating gx by gmx, and the other one is what if the artificial neural network gives us a little error in the stochastic collocation points. So what if uh, we don't have the perfect GMX, but we have a GM tilde X based on slight errors in the stochastic collocation points? Well, then this error is related to, uh, it's an expectation, so it's an integral over R times FX DX. It's related to the density of X here. And then the error is related to the error in the collocation points, the error in the collocation points times Ljx, so times the Lagrange interponent. A sum of j runs from one to m of this error in the, from the artificial neural network in the stochastic collocation points times Ljx. And if we uh, if we look at, we know that uh, uh, we know that uh, uh, the uh, the norm of the Lagrange interpolations is equal to one, right? In norm, the absolute value of Ljx is equal to one. So this can be bounded by the maximum error of, by, by the maximum of each of these errors. So the maximum of each of these errors in these M stochastic collocation points times the norm of Lj, which is one, that is in fact a bound for this uh, for this error. And of course, the integral over R of fx dx is equal to one. 
by definition, the density function. So this is the maximum in absolute value of the collocation in the collocation points. So our total error is composed of the error in the approximation by means of an, an interpolation plus the error that we find found by means of, uh, of the neural network. We can't be more quantitative in this because we really typically don't know the error from the artificial neural network based on, uh, yeah, it's a black box, right? So we don't know it. We, we cannot be more quantitative other than doing a lot of experiments and uh, seeing that it works. And of course, as I mentioned, an error from an artificial neural network is still a very interesting uh, research point. Okay, so how is it with the strong convergence? Well, I told you, we learn, we learn, this is the time axis, we learn based on these very tiny time steps. Yeah, a much smaller time step, zero to T, a much smaller time step than maybe the delta T that we are dealing with. Eh? We are working with a big time step and a, 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 a approximation of a distribution at a big time step of our distribution. But uh, uh, in the learning, we take very small time steps. So we get a good approximation for uh, the distribution at any point in time. However, then the approximation error from the artificial neural network and the SCMC, when they are negligible, then the strong convergence of the seven week scheme, we can define it as, uh, well, the, the, in expectation, the difference between our approximation at the TI and our uh, reference value at TI that is in fact connected to that very small, to that very small times uh, delta tau and that very tiny, tiny time step. So it is an error which is based on delta tau and delta tau is much smaller than delta T. So this is related to K times delta T to the beta. It's much smaller than K times delta T to the beta. Delta tau is then used in the offline artificial neural network training, and the time step delta t is used for the online artificial neural network prediction. Delta tau is much, much smaller than delta t. And for example, eh, to use an Euler scheme in the online phase would need a much, much finer time step to get the same accuracy a time step by a factor delta t over delta tau to achieve the same accuracy in the strong sense. So we have learned distributions based on a very small time step, and then we know the stochastic collocation points, and with that we know the distribution at any time step at any um, at any parameter value. Well, just before the break, I will tell you something about uh, that uh, scheme that is based on interpolation. Uh, so we call it the compression decompression scheme, CDC scheme. It is a, a cheaper variant. Uh, so it can be used to further reduce the computational cost. So uh, uh, again, we have these, uh, these uh, collocation points. Uh, and uh, in principle, I told you that for any point, and for any time step, we would use the artificial neural network to, uh, to come up with uh, the next point. But we can also do it a little differently. We can also only store a certain number of stochastic collocation points. And if we need to approximate a value in between, then we interpolate these stochastic collocation points. So that is what we do in this CDC scheme. We store, we store uh, uh, collocation points and we make sure that also in the evaluation in the paths, then we would use the interpolation and not neural network to, uh, to come up with the scheme. And when is this beneficial? Well, it's beneficial when the interpolation is much cheaper than the neural network. Right. So in the original scheme for all M paths, for all M paths, we would uh, uh, we would uh, uh, use uh, for all M paths, we would use uh, the, the neural network, the time for the neural network. 
And in this seven league CVC scheme, we would only use for MS, for a number of stochastic collocation points, we would use the neural network. So the time for the neural network is only for these MS. And for all the other paths, so M paths in total, so if this is only a few, for M paths in total, we would use the interpolation time. And if we look at that, then this is related to TI, the time for interpolation divided by the time for the neural network, plus MS over M. And uh, TI is the computational time for the neural network. T, uh, TA and TI for the interpolation. And given the fact that the number of paths is typically much larger than the number of points, then gamma is related to TI over TA. So when the employed interpolation is computationally cheaper than the neural network, then gamma is less than one. And then this interpolation-based seven-leak scheme would need fewer time, fewer computation than the seven-leak scheme. Okay, let me stop here for 10 minutes and then now let now let's do some numerical experiments with this seven leak scheme. And we stay in the, so it is a new scheme. So we still have to evaluate its quality. And therefore many of my, uh, of my numerical results are an academic setting. Yeah, it's an academic setting. And then we would like just to compare how good is it? And for example, if we use the geometric Brownian motion, the GBM, uh, so A, in that case, A is uh, like mu times S, as I mentioned, and B is time sigma times S. Then, uh, well, we know a lot about the process, right? We, we know the log normal distribution. We know uh, means and variances, et cetera, et cetera. So we stay in this talk in uh, the log normal distribution, uh, the, the geometric Brownian motion. But in the paper, there's also the ornstein ullenbeck process. Um, so we have a drift and we have a volatility that are constant, but uh, they can vary, of course, in the learning. They are open parameters. So the neural network is able to work with um, many values for mu and for sigma. And uh, of course, we know the analytic solution. So that is nice. Then we can compare our solutions. Our, if we look at the strong convergence, we would like to have a reference solution. And this is the reference solution, right? So S0 e to the power mu minus one half sigma squared t minus t0 plus sigma, the square root of t minus t0 times x. And here we also immediately see, right, if we do a Taylor expansion on this one, we get a good approximation uh, in, uh, in powers of x. But that's not necessary. This is our reference, our reference solution. And uh, the first thing we do is we start to train that neural network. So we uh, create a data set. We use the Euler-Mariana scheme with a very small time step. And we learn. And we have like 80,000 data samples from which we learn our weights and biases of the neural network. And as input, we vary the drift. It ranges from 0 to 0 0.1. The volatility is varied from 0 0.05 to 0 0.60. The uh, S0, the, the, the initial, initial point, is, uh, is varied from 0.1 to 15. And the T max, the time max, is varied from 0 to 1.6. And we use Latin hypercube sampling for, uh, for the, the variation in these first three. And we do an equidistant. Uh, yeah, an equidistant checking for this time max. And in this case, we know the output. We know, we know uh, y0, y, y1, y2, y3, y4, y5 for the geometric Brownian motion. Of course, we can learn them with SCMC, yeah, with stochastic collocation Monte Carlo method. And we give a range in which they should lie from 0 to 25 for the first one second one as well, the third one from 0 to 27, for all these varying uh, parameters from 0 to 55 and from 0 to 155 approximately. So these are the variations in these points. The neural network has four hidden layers. It has 50 neurons per layer. Per layer. We use a soft, soft plus activation function, the atom optimizer, a batch size of 
2024, a learning rate, an initial learning rate of 0.3 and a GLORO uniform initialization. And when we do that, we get a very accurate, so this is just a simple training. We want to see, can our neural network, can it learn the stochastic collocation points? We know the stochastic collocation points, how good are they? So we have this data set, we divide it in three parts, 80% for training, 10% for validation, and 10% for testing. And after 1500 training epochs, the artificial neural network has converged. And if we look at the maximum absolute error, so uh, it is one over M times the sum of uh, the errors, then we see that this is in fact rather small. Eh? It's two over a hundred uh, or seven over a hundred. So it's rather small. And if we, we know the collocation point, so here we, uh, we visualize the predicted, the neural network predicted collocation point number two, and here the true collocation point number two, and preferably this is a straight line, and you see that this is almost a straight line. There's maybe a little bit out, say, these bigger, these bigger uh, errors, they may be somewhere here, but uh, in general, for every set, for every for every data set, it is predicted quite well. And here for Y4, we do the same, the true one and the predicted one. And we also see maybe uh, towards the boundary of the domain, uh, the, of the parameter domain, it's not so good as, we, as I told you, but typically this is also a very accurate approximation. And now if we look at the the pathwise error, and we have a sample path, a sample path for the geometric Brownian motion. Then here, the black line here, that is the exact geometric Brownian motion. So that is based on this, on this evaluation. You draw, you take a sample from X, you uh, substitute it over here, and then you take a next time step, you take another sample. <laughs> And you take a sample from X, you draw it, and then you get the black line. Now, in the Milstein scheme, we see that in the beginning, it's pretty okay, and then it starts to deviate as we expected. And there's a little error here in the Milstein scheme, right? It has a strong convergence order of one. But if we use uh, our seven league scheme, either based on Lagrange or on uh, uh, on a monotone spline interpolation, you cannot distinguish, almost cannot distinguish by mere eye, the difference between uh, our scheme and the exact scheme. So it's really very accurate. It's very accurate. And if we look at strong convergence, then we see that when delta T grows, here we see delta T growing, when delta T grows, then the error should grow linearly with, uh, with the Milstein scheme. And that is what we also observe. But in our schemes, our schemes, they go differently, right? They are learned with a very, very tiny time step. So this time step that we use in the online simulation, that hardly plays a role in the error. So whenever we take a small value or a big value, we hardly see a difference in this, uh, in this uh, strong convergence plot. It is always accurate. Training costs some time, but after that, you can use it for any time step. And here we have specific choices for sigma, r, s0, and capital T. And we have used the barycentric version of the Lagrange interpolation. Now the CPU time, the CPU time is a, it's a little expensive. Eh? So we need to use that neural network all the time in the seven league scheme. And if we want to get uh, 10,000 sample paths until terminal time t is equal four, with the delta t equals one. So it's only four points in fact. And here with delta t equals two, it's only two points, eh? but they are accurate. So mind you, it's uh, until time four, but we only have uh, a few points in between. Uh, it's accurate. It takes 12 seconds, the seven league scheme. And these uh, interpolation based schemes, they still take like five seconds or nine seconds. However, Recent results by a new uh, PhD student show that it's much faster on the graphics processing unit. So we really have a, an uh, improvement of a factor of 20 or something like that. 
And when the time step is two times bigger, we only have uh, two time points. And then uh, we, uh, we have half of the CPU time, yeah? six, uh, six, uh, six uh, seconds and uh, two seconds approximately here. And really we do need this. Yeah? So suppose, for example, suppose you need to evaluate something in the financial industry, you need to evaluate it every day. Every day, once a day, you have to make a decision about things. Then you don't want these very small time steps in between. You just want to make a big time step, one per day, a, a time step of a day, and then get a good approximation and make your decision there. And that can be done with this seven week scheme. And we use it, of course, for so-called path dependent options. So we can use it for a Bermudan option with only a few time steps, or we can use it for uh, an Asian option, for example. And also we can compute the sensitivities of the path dependent options. So here we look at the Bermudan option under geometric Brownian motion, we take big time steps. And again, rem a reminder, the option holder has the right to exercise the contract at these pre-specified monitoring dates, once a week or something like that, right? Bermudan option, a certain part. Here we have four dates to exercise, and here we have eight monitoring days to exercise. We have a relative error that we are looking at, the, the, uh, the value of the option uh, from the reference solution. If, um, minus the value that we get from the seven league scheme divided by the reference solution. And the reference solution is then based on the analytic uh, form of the GBM. We have a certain volatility, point three, time step one, four points in which we monitor. And here we use the long step Schwartz method. We don't use SGBM. There's no reason for that. It's just the long step Schwartz that has been used here. Now, the analytic Monte Carlo gives us a value for the option of 0.15, and that is our reference, so it has no error. Uh, and the Milstein scheme would give us 0.138, and it has 8.8% error. And the seven league scheme gives us 0.1523, so it has 0.14% error, a much smaller error. Now, if we have eight monitoring days, so we have uh, two times as many and half the time step, then the analytic is 0.1616, and that's our reference. The error with Milstein with smaller time step is, of course, half, so it's only 4.5% error, and it ends up with 0.154. And the error with the seven league scheme is 0.1619, that's 0.21% error. Okay, so that, uh, that is still all very acceptable, right? And, uh, and we do that, of course, uh, we can do that uh, relatively easily. It's based on 100,000 paths, 100,000 paths, and we make them with only time steps between the monitoring dates. We hop with our seven league boots from monitoring date to monitoring date. The Asian option is a path dependent option. It depends on the average stock value. So the value of the fixed strike Asian option is uh, the payoff is the maximum of the average, the average stock value, one over the number of monitoring dates times the sum of, uh, of uh, times the sum of NB monitoring dates at which we look at the stock value in the past, okay, S at TK. It's a discrete average over NB dates. And minus K, this average minus K, the maximum of that and zero, that is the payoff. <laughs> then the option value itself is the discounted expected value under the risk neutral measure of that V of AT. And um, again, the analytic Monte Carlo gives us an, a number 0.285. The Milstein Monte Carlo gives us an error of like 8%, and the seven league scheme gives us an error of like 0.1%, which is much more affordable. All right. I am not going to discuss the Greeks. We can also compute the Greeks based on the neural network. So uh, that's for your own reference. Maybe interesting to have a look at it, but uh, it's in the slides. 
Um, but the conclusion for, uh, for this part with the seven league scheme is the following. So we have developed the seven league scheme. It is really new. So it fits to an advanced course in numerics. It uh, provides a data-driven numerical solver for SDEs. It's a prototype. So we still need to, uh, we, we still need a lot of work on this. So I have another M a PhD student working on this, for example. Numerical error in the sense of strong convergence that does not grow significantly when the step increases. And it has various applications in computational finance, like the credit valuation adjustment, like a path dependent option, et cetera. What are we doing more with this? Well, we will be looking at parallel computing in GPUs. It's almost finished, but uh, it can still be improved. And we want to solve multidimensional SDEs and also non-Markov processes. Yeah? So non-Markov processes. Processes. That is something else that we are aiming at here. And that gives us a history, a history that needs to be taken into account in the learning. So it's far from trivial. Okay, that is this part. And let's look at the other part. Uh, where is the other part? Okay, let me come up with uh, the other part. Um, I stop share for a second. And then uh, I share my screen. I look at my, uh, where is, oh yeah, here is this my, I think this is my, um, yeah. My slides are over here. And then I do the share again, share the screen. And here is the next part. So as I promised, I want to return to that SGBM. And I want to give some details. I'll talk a bit, a, a bit about uh, GPU computing in this case. <laughs> so uh, we have already said something about the Mabunin option pricing. I give a very brief recap, and then I'll say something about parallel computing, and I'll start with that cred credit value adjustment. So remember, we are in the high dimensional setting and an American option is a supremum, uh, the optimal stopping time, the supremum of T in that interval of uh, the discounted expected value of some function, which depends on ST, which is typically a payoff function. And in the Bermudan case, we only have a discrete set of time points at which we can make a decision. And this is uh, also important for a counterparty credit risk for an extra charge on top of an option because, uh, because the counterparty can go in default. Yeah, we have never discussed so far. We only look at the fair value of the option so far. We have not taken, at, uh, taken a look at all at our counterparty, but suppose that our counterparty goes in default and uh, the counterparty cannot pay an obligation. Suppose the holder of the, the, the writer goes in default and the, the writer cannot pay an obligation. And that may give an extra value or less value to an option. Well, the basis of all of this research work, all of this numerical research work is dynamic programming, high dimensions, and in this case, Monte Carlo valuation with regression. So we have seen this, right? We go from time step to time step back from final time to, uh, to initial time. Uh, at terminal time, we have the value of the payoff. It's the maximum of the intrinsic value and zero. At the intermediate time points, the value of the option. So the value of the option at time M, the value of the option at time M is the maximum of the intrinsic value and the continuation of the option. At some point, at some point, we would continue with the option and at some point it's better to exercise the option to get rid of it. And the continuation is then naturally defined as the future value, the expected value of the option at the new time point discounted to today. Okay, so discounted to today and when that 
uh, value, that expected value of the option is larger than exercising, then we keep the option. And when it's less than exercising, then we exercise, then we better exercise the option. And then this conditional expectation here, that causes a lot of trouble. Yeah? And uh, we have said that uh, uh, we first, we generate a lot of paths. Yeah? We generate, we start at zero. And we have S zero, could be multidimensional. We generate a lot of paths here. Yeah. And of course that goes like this. Yeah? So a, a lot of paths. And then I've shown these point clouds, these point clouds. In, uh, on each of these points, we had these point clouds and we divided them into bundles. Eh? For example, we chopped it in two pieces and then we chopped it in some more pieces here, et cetera, et cetera, all right? We, we worked in bundles. Yeah, we bundled on each time point, we bundled uh, these, uh, these stock values. And then we looked at, uh, uh, we started to approximate this future value of the option, this future value of the option. It's best to parameterize that. It's best to approximate that by a function, by a function with parameters. Because if we do that, we can more easily take the expectation. So we try to approximate the value of the option on that point cloud, on each of these points here we have a corresponding option value, right? We know the option value. We know the option value at each of these points. We have it at each of these points. It is either the continuation or the exercise value. That is the value of the option at a point. We parameterize that because then we can more easily take the expectation. Expectation of some function of S, yeah, the expectation of some function of S that is maybe closely connected to the moment S, S, S and S squared and S3 and S4 and in multi dimensions and with the strange payoff, these are a little bit different basis functions. But of course, this could be the mean. This is the second moment, the third moment, the fourth moment. So if we know the moments, it is relatively easy to work with monomials, right? If we have alpha one S plus alpha two S squared, et cetera, then it's relatively easy to have an analytic expression of this expectation. That is what we do. How do we do that? This slide was not there before. So we say, okay, our value of the option at the new time point, we make a parameterized function. We write it as a sum of coefficients per bundle, a sum of coefficients per bundle times uh, a polynomial, yeah, times a basis function. And we use ordinary least square. So we just look, we try to find the alphas per bundle for each of the bundles. We try to find the alphas for which the option value and the sum of alpha times the basis function squared for which this is optimal, minimal for which this approximation resembles the option values at the new time point as good as possible. By this, we get our alphas, our alphas per bundle, and we can do the regression. This is like the local regression. It's a local regression. And then of course we need that expectation of that Z function. So we choose our basis functions in such a way that we can do that analytically, preferably, right? So we para parameterize, uh, the parameterization maps the high dimensional space onto a low dimensional space with a mapping function, yeah? And then uh, in, uh, in the case of the number of bundles going to infinity, this is like the expected value of the option value. So uh, of the option value at the new time point, given, given, phi and given that we are now at time x at, at st we are at x that is what we are approximating it is not the perfect conditional expectation but of course when the bundles get smaller and smaller this starts to be a very good uh, implementation 
Now we had two ways of calculating. I still recall the, I want to recall this because there's something to say for both of them. We want to calculate this conditional expectation, the expected value of V at the new time point, given that we're at the old time point. And the first, the classical expression is that we use basis functions that are based on STM. The variance is bigger for this. It's, it's a little worse in case of the variance. So the variance is bigger, but it's very easy to compute. The expectation that we are looking for is in fact a sum of these coefficients that we compute with least squares times the basis functions itself. You don't need to know so much about your distribution of your S. So if you have a commercial, a commercial uh, path generator, a commercial simulation tool, and you don't know really what distribution is being used, this can still be used. And the other one cannot be used, right? So for industrial purposes, it's pretty okay to use the, the SRM. So just the, the standard regression method. And we often, we, we sometimes encounter this. Eh? We are looking at pension funds and they have in, a, a model for inflation, they have a model for the interest rate. They have a model for the FX for the foreign exchange, et cetera, et cetera. They're all combined. It is then not so easy to compute the expectation. In our case, when S is defined at the new time point, which is very nice from an academic point of view, and I'm an academic person, as you may, may remember, then we end up with this expectation. So we need to know something about the distribution of S in order to compute this expectation. We can do that in many, many cases, also in high dimensional cases, but sometimes in commercial cases, we cannot do that. We cannot find that expectation. So that is what I wanted to tell you about this. We use this. We choose our basis function so that we can compute this analytically. And you saw in the previous talk eh, uh, before uh, in the morning, that it's not always easy. And we had something with uh, uh, um, uh, all sorts of uh, all sorts of factorials, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's not always trivial to get it, but it is possible. And we had these two estimators: a direct estimator and a path estimator. And uh, this gives us a biased high estimator and this a low biased estimator. And together they make an interval in which the true solution lies. Of course, Monte Carlo is based on stochastic paths. It's based on simulation. So we always have an uncertainty and we have a confidence interval. Here, it is based on the direct estimator, which is using it, using the method as I have just explained it. Yeah, we generate one set of paths. With that, we determine the early exercise points. We determine the option values and we compute the option value at time zero. And the path estimator is, there's one set of paths by which you determine the early exercise points and with a fresh set, a new set of points, a new, new set of asset paths, you do the, the computation of the option value. And that is typically then biased low and uh, the combination gives us a confidence interval. And uh, the Greeks, they are relatively easily uh, obtained. So uh, the Greeks, V at S minus V, uh, V at uh, a little bit differently from S minus V at S divided by S plus X minus S. And then we can use in the, in the case of uh, GB, SGBM, we can use uh, for, this, uh, for this computation, we can use the Z function. We have a Z function for the whole option value. And with that Z function, we can compute, in fact, we can compute uh, the expectations and we can compute the derivative. So that is what we do. It's relatively easy to, uh, to compute uh, uh, the, the sensitivities, whereas that's not so easy for other uh, Monte Carlo methods in which we have early exercise features. Now, what if we bring it on, uh, on a, a GPU, on a graphics processing unit? And that was work from Alvaro Leitao in his, uh, his uh, PhD thesis. 
So we have a CUDA, so we work uh, in parallel on the uh, graphics processing units, and we have two stages. Of course, forward, we simulate many paths. Yeah, until time t, we simulate many, many paths. And that can be done in parallel, of course. They can all be, they can all be, uh, be generated uh, uh, individually and uh, in parallel. And backwards, in backwards step, hey, so we, if we go back, we start at final time and then we do this bundling. And for each of these bundles, we compute all these things that we need to compute. And then we do another bundling and then we may do another bundling. Well, in the backward phase, all these bundles can be computed simultaneously. So all the bundles in one time step, they can be computed simultaneously. So if we have many bundles, if we are, hey, if we are in high dimensions, a high dimensional option, if we have many bundles, many paths, many bundles, then you can imagine that it is beneficial to do the parallelization. Well, if we don't have this, we need not parallelize, right? The random numbers we can get on the fly, there's something like a QRent library, and each bundle calculation, the option value and the regression, that can be performed in parallel. And then we have one GPU thread per bundle. And all threads collaborate to compute the continuation value. Well, one important notion is that these very fancy bundling schemes that I've just explained to you, these colorful RT pictures eh, of uh, recursive bisection and, and uh, k-means clustering, they look very pretty but they are in fact too slow for parallel processing. It just takes too long to do that, uh, that clustering. K means clustering, it is too expensive. It costs too much memory, it takes too much time. Now here in the parallel case, we propose a new technique. We do it as simple as possible. We, we call it equal partitioning, equipartitioning. And it consists of two stages, we have all these stock values per time step. And we just do some sorting. According to some criterion, we do some sorting. The biggest first and the smallest last, but it's a multidimensional thing. But we do some sorting, a very quick sort. And then the partitioning in the bundles, we just split it in equal parts. We don't look at proximity. Hey, you remember we had all these point clouds all these points and we uh, we made it so nice uh, let me see let me take this one maybe we made it so nice that we split it like this and then we split it like this and we thought about it carefully where are the means etc and the good news here was that if we when we were dealing with such a with such a detail here there would be always proximity of the stock prices, eh? also in multi-dimensions. This is a two-dimensional picture, but also in multi-dimension. So if you are approximating this wildly varying function and you have this small piece here, you would still have proximity and we could still use a few basis functions to get an accurate prediction or an accurate approximation here. Now, essentially, we have no idea where our points land, right? We just cut it, we split it in pieces, we sort it, we split it, and there will be some rule, but we don't know it exactly. So we are not entirely sure that when we split it, that we are really having this proximity region. Could be that we have this and we have maybe something here. We have no idea at this stage, but it is very fast, of course. Sorting is very fast. And uh, partitioning, just splitting in pieces, is very fast. And in fact, it works fine. So it, it seems to work fine. We have here a 5D case, a 10D case, and a 15D case. We have the, the direct estimator, the path estimator. We look at the arithmetic basket option. We have a reference value. And we see that the, the direct estimator and the and the other estimator, they seem to converge when the number of bundles is already greater than four. It looks good. Yeah, it starts to look good. There is convergence. And the same here, 
Uh, this is the arithmetic basket and this is the geometric basket. For the arithmetic basket, we have the solution in closed form because it can be reduced to a one dimensional case. And for the arithmetic basket option, we just see a convergence appear. The lower and the upper, so the, the biased high and the biased low estimated, they converge. Now, how much can we win? Again, a picture of how we do it. So in the forward process, when we generate the stock prices, then uh, we can do them all uh, parallel. Uh, so the forward process goes parallel and the backward process, that is this clustering, all these, all these bundles, they can be done dealt sim simultaneously. Yeah, so the bundles at time TM minus one can be done at the same time. The bundles at some other time can be done at the same time and also there. And these bundles can vary, right? There can be a small one here, a big one here. It just depends on, the, well, when it's equal partitioning, they are all of the same size, of course. So here is some details about the supercomputer that we were using. So uh, um, it has a C compiler, it has a CUDA compiler. We looked at these, uh, these uh, geometric and arithmetic basket Bermudan options with a certain number of uh, stock value at zero was 40, X was 40. So the strike uh, K is X is 46% interest rate. Those were the days. Um, uh, sigma, the volatility 0.2, uh, a correlation of 0.25, capital T equals one and 10 early exercise dates. We used three basis functions, a multidimensional geometric Brownian motion, and an Euler discretization in this case. Now let's look. This is really high dimensional. So this is like 30 stocks, 30 dimensional, 40 stocks, and 50 stocks. Yeah. And this is like 1024 bundles. And this is uh, 1024 times 16 bundles. Yeah. So 16,000 something bundles. In C, in C, this costs us 300 seconds. In, four, in 40 dimensions, 400, and in 50 dimensions, 600. On the GPU, with CUDA as the programming language, it costs us only four seconds, six seconds, and eight seconds. And the speed up on this hardware is like a, a factor 76, 75. And the same with more bundles, with more bundles. The bundles are a little bit smaller, of course, eh? so there's uh, some more computation going on, but there's more parallelism because we have more bundles, and we but we still get a factor of 75. And the CPU time is still like eight, eight seconds, four seconds on the CUDA. And for the arithmetic basket option, it should be similar. It's a little bit more expensive in C, eh, 900 seconds, uh, almost half an hour, and uh, almost 45 minutes, right? Uh, and in CUDA, it is 11 seconds, 17 seconds, and 26 seconds for 1024 bundles and a speed up of almost 100. And uh, with uh, 16,000 bundles, uh, mind you, uh, we are in high dimensions. We have a lot of paths. So again, we win a factor of, uh, a factor of uh, 97. So it's pretty it's pretty uh, uh, advantageous to do this on, uh, on parallel hardware. And financial institutions also have uh, access to parallel hardware often. They either uh, have it at their, uh, in their uh, research environments or they can use it in the cloud. Yeah, there's in the cloud, there's also the possibility to run parallel computer, uh, to run parallel code. And that is often done. I know a lot of banks who do that. Eh? So I know one bank who has their own cluster, but I know many banks that, uh, that pay uh, a monthly fee to work in the cloud. And I can tell you that monthly fee is really high, but anyways, it pays off. The final part for today, the last uh, 10 minutes or so, I want to tell you something about the so-called credit valuation adjustment to take into account counterparty credit risk. And I used to do that with my PhD student, uh, Xian Feng, and she got, a P uh, she got her PhD in 2016 and then started to work at ING Bank in Amsterdam. Counterparty 
added risk. That is the risk that a counterparty will default prior to the finalization of the contract. And so if a counterparty has some obligations, has some payment obligations, and it defaults, it may not be able to pay. That's a problem, right? So far, as I mentioned, we only looked at the fair value of the option, discounted risk neutral measure, these type of things. But now we have something in uh, coming into play, which we have not yet looked at. What if our uh, counterparty is not uh, able to fulfill its uh, payment obligations? Right? So again, the second bullet here, counterparty credit risk, it was not included in the pricing. So we need a specific adjustment from the default free value of a derivative we need to add. Yeah? If you think that your counterparty may default, you may make the option a little bit more expensive because you need to compensate for the fact that the counterparty may not be able to fulfill its uh, payment obligations. So credit value adjustment, it's one out of many adjustments. Eh? So it's CVA. And generally, there are many adjustments nowadays. They are collectively named XVA, total value adjustment. For many steps in the process, in the process of financing an option contract, for many of these steps, an extra uh, valuation adjustment is made. It gets more expensive because maybe money needs to be found, capital needs to be found, hedging may cost money, the counterparty may go in default. I may go in default. All these things will give a little extra in to the price of the option. The credit value adjustment, that is the difference between the risk-free portfolio value and the portfolio value that includes the counterparty's possible default. So CVA, if you wish, that is the market value of counterparty risk. CVA depends on the probability of default of a counterparty, naturally, the future exposure to a counterparty. So when a counterparty goes in default, how much can we potentially lose? So what is our future exposure to that counterparty? And also the loss given default. When the counterparty defaults, do we lose everything or do we lose only a part of the money that, we, uh, that, that, uh, that is outstanding? So CVA is like an expectation of uh, uh, the fact that uh, the uh, default time is uh, before the final time of the contract, okay? the probability of default, the future exposure, how much do we have at stake, how much money is there in the future that, uh, that we can potentially lose, times one minus delta times the loss given the default, how much or what percentage of our exposure do we lose? And also in research, there are still many interesting questions in this area. Like uh, uh, if we have an implied volatility skew and smile like we had in the very first lecture, does that impact the CVA? How does that impact it? If we try to hedge the CVA and it goes wrong, so we have a wrong way risk uh, uh, we try to hedge, but it goes adversely. So our exposure increases. Or when these probability of default and uh, our exposure, when they are correlated, right? When these are correlated, when, when a party goes in default and then my exposure explodes, for example, that is possible if they are correlated. How can that be modeled? That is wrong way risk. That's a risk that goes in the wrong way. We try to have this as a compensation for the default, but if this amplifies with the default, that is extra difficult. And we look at expected exposure, and this is like an exposure, we call that an exposure, a future exposure. And in this work, we look at the expected exposure, how much exposure do we expect to have to the counterparty in the future? And we look at the potential future exposure. So we look at how much is our maximum loss when the counterparty goes in default. So essentially how that goes as, as follows. We look at what we have in terms of contracts with a counterparty. 
It could be uh, all sorts of options. It could be swaps. It could be all sorts of bonds and interest rates and swaps. Then we simulate the future. We simulate the future. Again, we simulate the, the underlying stock prices. We simulate the underlying uh, asset prices, etc. We simulate all of these. And at a specific time in the future, we look at what is our exposure. Yeah. How much money do we uh, do we lose so how much how much exposure do we have to the counterpart when the stock value is like here or when these asset values are like here we have a big exposure okay? and here we have the expected exposure at this specific point in time and here we have something like a potential future exposure which is like a quanta and we need to do that uh, we need to do this computation it's not related to monitoring days, but the regulator tells us we need to do this every day. Every day, by the end of the day, we need to do this computation and it needs to be fi finished before the next day trading starts. We need to look at, uh, at the expected exposure to our counterparties and this potential future exposure is often connected to trading limits. Yeah? So uh, risk management in uh, financial institutions give some trading limits to certain count for certain counterparties to their traders and that is related to the tails eh, the quantas the tails of the distribution so how how fat are my tails in the distribution so this looks a little bit like what we did before right we simulate <clears throat> we need to come up with uh, an exposure and that is related to all the contracts that we have, a number of contracts that we have with a counterparty. And then based on that, we do our metrics that are given by the regulator. The European Central Bank tells us we need to compute expected exposure. We need to compute potential future exposure. And we need to compute a lot more of these measures. And of course, they will check how did we do our simulation of the future? What are the correlations involved? How do we see this future and what are our exposures? So the exposure, in fact, is the replacement cost of a portfolio. Yeah, so how much money do we lose when the counterparty goes in default? It is how much money replaces our portfolio. Yeah, so on a given outcome, omega in omega, at the point TM, the exposure is the maximum of, say, our contract, V at omega and zero. And when we have no exposure, okay, then uh, if they go in, in default, we have no, uh, no harm done to us in this case. So it is the maximum of, uh, yeah, of the money that, that, uh, that, uh, is owe, uh, that, that the counterparty would owe us. Okay? So, in option pricing, this is often difficult, but in, for example, swaps and swaps and swaptions. So in interest rate market, we have either a profit or a loss in a contract, right? And in forwards and futures, we often have either a loss or a profit. So we can also have an exposure when we sold the contract. So VW, is the market price of the portfolio computed under the risk neutral measure. Okay. These are these portfolios, these are traded quantities. So we always need to compute under the risk neutral measure. We, we look at the future, we compute this under the risk neutral measure. The exposure at a path at time t is the exposure e, uh, is then uh, the continuation value if the option is not yet exercised, it's the continuation value. And when the option or when the, when the products are exercised, then the exposure is zero, right? When, when the contracts are exercised, our, uh, our contract with that counterparty terminates. So we have no obligations or duties anymore. And if we are still in a contract with the counterparty, then it is in fact the continuation value like the continuation value in the Bermudan option case, eh, the continuation value, the expected value of this exposure, the expected value of the future exposure, discounted to now that we look for. 
And the expected exposure, that is uh, the expectation of the exposure, the expected value of the exposure, it's one over N, the sum little n runs from one to capital N of the exposure. Yeah, of all the paths that we simulated. Yeah, so we simulated a lot of paths and we look at the expected exposure. It's some sort of average of the exposure here, right? So Q, the continuation value is calculated at each time step along the path and we can use SGBM for that. Yeah, so this can be done, for example, with SGBM. Um, and this is, well, let's finalize with a picture uh, today and then I continue on uh, Thursday, of course. If we have the exposure here and we have time here and at T0, we have no exposure. And uh, then we start a contract. So here we start a contract. So we have our exposure. Then we see how uh, the market develops and the expected exposure typically goes like this. And when uh, uh, it is like an early exercise option. So sometimes it's exercised on a certain conditions it's exercised. So at the final time of the contract, the exposure is zero. And the exposure goes down all the time. And then the PFE, which is like a quantile, that still has a, a huge uh, value at, uh, it's the PFE 97.5%. It still has a huge uh, uh, a profile in time. So the first it increases and then it decreases. And by the end of the contract, by the end of the contract, it is also equal to zero. And these pictures often look similarly. And here we did a computation with SGBM and also with the cost method. We can use both of these methods for this. Exposures, conditional expectations, mm -hmm. nothing to worry about for us, right? Now we are experts. So, um, and we see that essentially they give us the same values for PFE, for EE and for PFE 2.5%. So let me conclude here, it's time, and I can, uh, I'm happy to take some questions.